Chapter eighty eight of the Adventures of Peregrine Pickle, Volume two, by Tobias Smollett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Geeson. Chapter eighty eight. He is visited by Pallet, contracts an intimacy with a Newmarket nobleman, and is by the knowing ones taken in this affair being settled and our adventurer for the present free of all female connections he returned to his former course of fast living among the bucks of the town and performed innumerable exploits among whores bullies rooks constables and justices of the peace in the midst of these occupations he was one morning visited by his old fellow-traveller pallet whose appearance gave him equal surprise and concern though the weather was severe he was clothed in a thin summer dress which he had wore at paris and was now not only threadbare but in some parts actually patched his stockings by a repetition of that practice known among economists by the term of coaxing hung like pudding bags about his ankles his shirt though new washed was of the saffron hue and in divers places appeared through the crannies of his breeches he had exchanged his own hair for a smoke-dried tie periwig which all the flour in his drudging box had not been able to whiten his eyes were sunk his jaws lengthened beyond their usual extension and he seemed twenty years older than he looked when he and our hero parted at rotterdam in spite of all these evidences of decay he accosted him with a meagre affectation of content and good humour struggled piteously to appear gay and unconcerned professed his joy at seeing him in england excused himself for having delayed so long to come and present his respects alleging that since his return he had been a mere slave to the satisfaction of some persons of quality and taste who had insisted upon his finishing some pieces with the utmost expedition peregrine received him with that compassion and complaisance which was natural to his disposition inquired about the health of mistress pallet and his family and asked if his friend the doctor was in town the painter seemed to have resumed his resentment against that gentleman of whom he spoke in contemptuous terms the doctor said he is so much overshadowed with presumption and self-conceit that his merit has no relief it does not rise there is no keeping in the picture my dear sir all the same as if i were to represent the moon under a cloud there will be nothing but a deep mass of shade with a tiny little speck of light in the middle which would only serve to make as it were the darkness visible you understand me had he taken my advice it might have been better for him but he's bigoted to his own opinion you must know mr pickle upon our return to england i counselled him to compose a little smart clever ode upon my cleopatra as gad shall judge me i thought it would have been of some service in helping him out of obscurity for you know as sir richard observes soon will that die which adds thy fame to mine let me then live joined to a work of thine by the by there is a most picturesque contrast in these lines of thy and me living and dying and thine and mine ah a pies upon it dick after all was the man 
ecod he rounded it off <laughs> but to return to this unhappy young man would you believe it he tossed up his nose at my friendly proposal and gabbled something in greek which is not worth repeating the case was this my dear sir he was out of humour at the neglect of the world he thought the poets of the age were jealous of his genius and strove to crush it accordingly while the rest of mankind wanted taste sufficient to discern it for my own part i profess myself one of these and as the clown in billy shakespeare says of the courtier's oath had i sworn by the doctor's genius that the pancakes were not they might have been for all that very good yet shouldn't i have been forsworn let that be as it will he retired from town in great dudgeon and set up his rest near a hill in derbyshire with two tops resembling parnassus and a well at the bottom which he had christened hip o the green egad if he stays in that habitation tis my opinion he'll soon grow green with the hip indeed he'll be glad of an opportunity to return to the flesh-pots of egypt and pay his court to the slighted queen cleopatra ha well remembered by this light you shall know my good sir that this same egyptian princess has been courted by so many gallants of taste that as i hope to live i found myself in some sort of dilemma because in parting with her to one i should have disobliged all his rivals now a man would not choose to give offence to his friends at least i lay it down as a maxim to avoid the smallest appearance of ingratitude perhaps i may be in the wrong but every man has his way for this reason i proposed to all the candidates that a lottery or raffle should be set on foot by which every individual would have an equal chance for her good graces and the prize be left to the decision of fortune the scheme was mightily relished and the terms being such a trifle as half a guinea the whole town crowded into my house in order to subscribe but where i was their humble servant gentlemen you must have a little patience till my own particular friends are served among that number i do myself the honour to consider mr pickle here is a copy of the proposals and if the list should be adorned with his name i hope notwithstanding his merited success among the young ladies he will for once be shunned by that little vixen called miss fortune <laughs> so saying he bowed with a thousand apish conges and presented his paper to peregrine who seeing the number of subscribers was limited to one hundred said he thought him too moderate in his expectations as he did not doubt that his picture would be a cheap purchase at five hundred instead of fifty pounds at which the price was fixed to this unexpected remark pallet answered that among the connoisseurs he would not pretend to appraise his picture but that in valuing his works he was obliged to have an eye to the gothic ignorance of the age in which he lived our adventurer saw at once into the nature of this raffle which was no other than a begging shift to dispose of a paltry piece that he could not otherwise have sold for twenty shillings however far from shocking the poor man in distress by dropping the least hint of his conjecture he desired to be favoured with six chances 
if the circumstances of his plan would indulge him so far and the painter after some hesitation condescended to comply with his request out of pure friendship and veneration though he observed that in doing so he must exclude some of his most intimate companions having received the money he gave pickle his address desiring he would with his convenience visit the princess who he was sure would display her most engaging attractions in order to captivate his fancy and took his leave extremely well pleased with the success of his application though peregrine was tempted with the curiosity of seeing this portrait which he imagined must contain some analogy to the ridiculous oddity of the painter he would not expose himself to the disagreeable alternative of applauding the performance contrary to the dictates of conscience and common sense or of condemning it to the unspeakable mortification of the miserable author and therefore never dreamt of returning the painter's visit nor did he ever hear of the lottery's being drawn about this time he was invited to spend a few weeks at the country seat of a certain nobleman with whom he had contracted an acquaintance in the course of his debauches which we have already described his lordship being remarkable for his skill and success in horse racing his house was continually filled with the connoisseurs and admirers of that sport upon which the whole conversation turned insomuch that peregrine gradually imbibed some knowledge in horse-flesh and the diversions of the course for the whole occupation of the day exclusive of eating and drinking consisted in viewing managing and exercising his lordship's stud our hero looked upon these amusements with an eye of taste as well as curiosity he contemplated the animal as a beautiful and elegant part of the creation and relished the surprising exertion of its speed with refined and classical delight in a little time he became personally acquainted with every horse in the stable and interested himself in the reputation of each while he also gratified his appetite for knowledge in observing the methods of preparing their bodies and training them to the race his landlord saw and encouraged his eagerness from which he promised himself some advantage he formed several private matches for his entertainment and flattered his discernment by permitting him to be successful in the first bets he made thus was he artfully decoyed into a spirit of keenness and adventure and disposed to depend upon his own judgment in opposition to that of people who had made horse racing the sole study of their lives he accompanied millard to newmarket and entering at once into the genius of the place was marked as fair game by all the knowing ones there assembled many of whom found means to take him in in spite of all the cautions and admonitions of his lordship who wanted to reserve him for his own use it is almost impossible for any man let him be never so fearful or phlegmatic to be an unconcerned spectator in this busy scene the daimon of play hovers in the air like a pestilential vapour tainting the minds of all present with infallible infection which communicates from one person to another like the circulation of a general panic peregrine was seized with this epidemic distemper to a violent degree and after having lost a few loose hundreds 
in his progress through the various rookeries of the place entered into partnership with his noble friend in a grand match upon the issue of which he ventured no less than three thousand pounds indeed he would not have risked such a considerable sum had not his own confidence been reinforced by the opinion and concurrence of his lordship who hazarded an equal bet upon the same event these two associates engaged themselves in the penalty of six thousand pounds to run one chaise and four against another three times round the course and our adventurer had the satisfaction of seeing his antagonist distanced in the first and second heat but all of a sudden one of the horses of his machine was knocked up by which accident the victory was ravished almost from his very grasp and he was obliged to endure the damage and the scorn he was deeply affected with this misfortune which he imputed to his own extravagance and temerity but discovered no external signs of affliction because his illustrious partner bore his loss with the most philosophic resignation consoling himself as well as pickle with the hope of making it up on some other occasion nevertheless our young gentleman could not help admiring and even envying his equanimity not knowing that his lordship had managed matters so as to be the gainer by the misfortune which to retrieve peregrine purchased several horses at the recommendation of his friend and instead of returning to london made a tour with him to all the celebrated races in england at which after several vicissitudes of fortune he made shift before the end of the season to treble his loss but his hopes seemed to increase with his ill luck in the beginning of winter he came to town fully persuaded that fortune must necessarily change and that next season he should reap the happy fruits of his experience in this confidence he seemed to drown all ideas of prudence and economy his former expense was mere parsimony compared with that which he now incurred he subscribed to the opera and half a dozen concerts at different parts of the town was a benefactor to several hospitals purchased a collection of valuable pictures took a house and furnished it in a most magnificent taste laid in a large stock of french wines and gave extravagant entertainments to his quality friends who in return loaded him with compliment and insisted upon his making use of their interest and good will end of chapter eighty eight